Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a, a pastor DJ, and I'm gonna ask Michael to come down here with me. These are local pastors right here, but I realize that they haven't yet had the the privilege of being able to minister in a different way. And today, since we're talking about the anointing, is it possible that there is a secret for the Christian to the meaning of life? and to your destiny, and it's found within the anointing. Yes, you, you can have a, a successful career as, as a Christian. You can own your own business. You can be involved in, in a lot of good things and everything else. But is there a different level when the anointing comes and that you find the deeper meaning of your life, you find the destiny within the kingdom of God. So at the end of the service today, we're going to anoint people for that. And these two, they're going to be up here worshiping and leading us in a worship song at that time. So I didn't want them to feel like they were left out of it because I believe God is raising up young men and young women for this day, don't you? Amen. So I'm going to, I'm going to anoint these two men here this morning as we start the the service here so that while you're up there being ministering to us through music and we're anointing others, I didn't want you to especially to miss out for it because I see the call of God on both of your lives. So come over here together, yeah, right here in the middle and we'll, we'll uh, hey, let me, let me ask uh, uh, Al and, and our Pastor Carol and Pastor Al and who else, uh, Nelson, these are all our local pastor people here. I'm going to ask them to come up and lay hands on these two men. Amen. And now, I wasn't planning to do this. That's why I got up and, you know, so I went and got the oil and stuff. God said, you're talking about something. And we're talking the, today, the story will be Elijah putting the anointing in the mantle on Elisha. And so I'm believing that God's going to, going to bless the next generation with that kind of anointing. So, Father, I anoint DJ first. We thank you, Lord, for this man. We thank you for the call that's upon his life. I pray that from this day forward, a deeper meaning for his life, an anointing that allows him to realize his destiny within your kingdom. We thank you for that, Lord, and we ask for your blessing to be upon this man. Lord, we see the gifts and the graces, and we thank you. We thank you for his steps of faith. Bless and anoint this man in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, I anoint Michael right now. We know the call that's upon his heart. Lord, just as I prayed for DJ, this is a man that you've set aside. I pray too that he would sense that there is a deeper meaning to his life and it's within the anointing, within the power of the Holy Spirit. May he too sense his destiny. Sin and Satan has wanted to rob him of it, wanted to lie to him about it. Lord, nothing takes away your hand in our lives. Circumstances, life, sin, none of those things. Lord, you forgive us, you heal us, and you move us to greater realms because we will have a witness and a testimony of your grace and your power. May that anointing fall upon Michael, I pray. May that power fall upon him. And may these men move mountains for the kingdom of God. And may they make a difference in their generation, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. But let's look at the seven things that you learned last week. The anointing does what? It's the power from God. It's not from man. It's not from the church. It's not from a pastor. It's not from a prophet. It's the power from God. It's a covering of his spirit. It's sacred and it seals you. When you get into Paul's writings, it's so cool. He says, and you've now been anointed with the Holy Spirit and it has sealed you. I love that. It sets you apart and it's misunderstood. Too many people haven't thought they could seek out the anointing. But we as Christians are supposed to seek it. It's real, but it can also be counterfeit, and we talked about that last week. It brings healing, 
and it gives position i.e. in the Old Testament, it gave position to the prophet that was anointed, it gave position to the priest that was anointed, and it gave position for the king that was anointed. Now last week, we gave you some scriptures, and I love this one in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. Sometimes it's good to continue to lay precept upon precept, and we're gonna build on this here in just a moment. Listen to what it says in verse 26 and 27. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. (gasps) Someone would want to lead you astray about the anointing. This one he goes on to say, as for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit just as it has taught you remain in him now here's some new part i'm going to give you a little dab of new in here then we're going to cover one more thing that we covered last week listen to this the anointing teaches you that means the spirit of god that's the anointing god's spirit so that you see things through the spirit realm not through your flesh and just through your mind but you see things within the kingdom you have a greater discernment because it's a spiritual discernment paul actually says there's some things that can only be discerned spiritually all right the first in this is the anointing teaches us that we're protected we're protected Now, it doesn't mean that we're not in a battle, but we're protected when in that battle. And whatever happens to us can only happen to us because it came through the hand of God. The second is we are blessed. The anointing teaches you you're a blessed people. You're part not of this world. You're in this world, but you're not of it. Though this body may fail you, you still are alive. As a matter of fact, I love it that when Billy Graham said, when, when I die, I'm just changing addresses and he'll be more alive than he ever has been. And we know that's true. The third is the anointing teaches us we are empowered. What you try to accomplish in your flesh, in your own abilities, can get you so far. The anointing will get you exactly where God wanted you to be. That's the empowerment that you know when you're sensing, you're moving in the spirit where you arrived. And it doesn't mean where you arrived is always feeling like a good place. It may feel like you're in the fire, but you are arrived where God wants you because sometimes he needs an anointed man or woman in a place where there's a lot of fire or a lot of darkness and you're the light in that darkness all right the fourth thing is the anointing teaches us we have special purposes and specific purposes the two s's here the anointing will teach you about these things that god has a plan for his followers and this is so important this is why when i when i use the word that you find your meaning in life Some people find their career, they find their calling, but they don't really see the meaning in it. And the meaning is found many times in these special purposes and specific purposes. I found that as a pastor, when I'm called someplace, it's not my outcome of what will happen within that church. It's God's. And sometimes he takes me places for specific purposes and special purposes that I didn't even know that something was about I I'll share with this to you I thought for years I made a mistake God why did I go to Clovis New Mexico not Clovis California Clovis New Mexico I I was only there two years the shortest pastorate that I've ever had two years you can't even learn everybody's name especially in a church that was running for almost 500 people and I thought Lord I don't know why I'm here Till right before I leave, we had an Easter. And a man makes it down here. You've heard the story. If you heard it before, here it is. It's worth repeating it. Because why? God put me there for a specific and a special purpose in a man's life. He was my milkman in Philadelphia that delivered milk at the little deli that I worked at. And I look back on that and I go, Lord, you took me all the way 
to Clovis, New Mexico, because you so love the world and you know who's the secret or what is the secret, special, specific purpose to get to the heart so that everybody that in this day and time can say, be without an excuse, God, you did love me enough that you would send that you would say this, you'd bring this situation so that you would know that you had a chance for the kingdom of God. I love it that my milkman got saved on that Easter. I was gone within six weeks after that. Isn't that amazing? The, the final thing that the anointing teaches us is how to further the understanding about the kingdom. Often, as Christians, we operate so much, so, so very much about family, church, business, neighborhoods. And you forget that these things you see with your eyes isn't the whole situation. That you're only in this world, but you're of a kingdom. And when the anointing comes upon you, all of a sudden you realize something. When you're at work, you're not just at work. The kingdom's there at work with you. When you're in your neighborhood and you go, oh, what a bad neighborhood to live in, or oh, what's happening in my neighborhood? But you're the kingdom is in that neighborhood. See how this works? The anointing will teach you about the kingdom of God. And, and I pray that today's stories that I'm going to share with you will enlighten you in these areas. Now, let's do one more little quick review. That wasn't a review, that was new that you just got. But in Exodus chapter 30, last week we gave you a whole formula of how they created what they called a sacred anointing oil. Sounded powerful, doesn't it? We pick that up again now in verse 25. Make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blended, the work of a perfumer. It will be the sacred anointed oil. Now, Skip down. You heard this last week. Now, if some of you do like I do when I'm hearing someone's preach, I read sometimes a little before and a little bit after you. Some of you last week said, wow, there was a sentence at the end here that he never even mentioned, didn't get to, and, and that seemed pretty significant. I left it out on purpose. Part two. We're going to get to it today. Pick it up in verse 30. Anoint Aaron and his sons and and consecrate them so that they may serve me as priests. That's not on your screen. Now, verse 31 through 33. Say to the Israelites, this is to my sacred anointing oil for the, this is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generation to come. Do not pour it on anyone else's body and do not make any other oil using the same formula. It's sacred and you are to consider it sacred. Whoever makes perfume like it and puts it on anyone other than a priest must be cut off from their people. Oh, okay, so it's only for a special people. Now, this was the ingredients in to how to create a sacred oil, and it was especially for who? the priest. If anybody else got anointed with it, they were cut off. One of the, the coolest things that Jesus brought when he came and was born of a virgin, fully man, fully God, was that he brought a new system to the world. The church, really the temple, worked in a temple system where there was this separation from God because of what? Sin. And they had the Holy of Holies. So as this, this series, this little mini-series is preparing you for Easter. At what happens on Calvary, the curtain to the Holy of Holies is separated. Jesus brings a new system. There's no longer any separation. Does it change then this anointing that's only for a priest? Yes and no. It's still for a priest, but he changed who can be a priest now? Where do you find that? Go with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm sorry, that's 1 Peter chapter 2. 
I had that chapter 2 in my mind there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Now, remember, Jesus has already done what? He's already tore the curtain in two. Actually, the Father did it while Jesus was on the cross. The Father tore it and said, there's no longer a separation. We're no longer under a temple system where you have to go to a man to be able to have your sins forgiven. You now have direct access to God. And this is how Peter records it. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. (gasps) The anointing is for the priest. He didn't change that. He changed you and I through what he did. The followers of Christ automatically are brought into the family of God and you are transformed. You are changed. You're the chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, and that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. What are we starting on Easter? From darkness to light. We're going to do a five-part series just on this. You will know the background and the foundation of this, that you can understand this because of the Spirit and because of the anointing of God on your life, that you've been transformed. You didn't just add knowledge about a Savior. You were changed supernaturally from darkness to light, from being a simple person to you have a more of a destiny than you ever thought you had because he moved you and transformed you into this type of person. So you see, if you didn't understand these things, can you see how you really, even though you might be successful in your career, good at your business, good at, at, at your, what you've been educated for, but you might be missing the true destiny within all that because you haven't been operating to this with an anointing on you. It doesn't mean you're gonna change careers necessarily, but it means that you're gonna see that career so totally different because you're seeing it through the eyes of the kingdom, not through the eyes of this world. All right, here we go. The anointing, the anointed for special purposes. There's specific purposes and special purposes. The special purposes are this, so that you could find these two things. One, the anointing helps us to understand our meaning in life. Two, the anointing to achieve our destiny, where? Within the kingdom of God. So your destiny is an eternal destiny, not just a here and now destiny. So meaning in life and destiny within the kingdom. These are the special purposes of the anointing of God. When you think the anointing is just about lifting you up or making you something special, you've missed it. It's about putting a spotlight on what God does when someone accepts him. It transforms that man, transforms that woman. They've gone from a dead person, dead spiritually, to life. I love that. Now, all this... You would think that God would want to have a New Testament story that that shows this and so much. But you see, God wants you to know that Jesus coming wasn't a new idea. The anointing wasn't a new idea. It's the way God always operated in his kingdom because his kingdom has always been. So we're going to look at the story that really is what to the Jews especially, their foundational understanding about the anointing. Now, wait a minute, the Jews don't even recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but they know there's a power for an anointing, and the anointing deals with their meaning in life and their destiny in life. Isn't it sad that they missed that Jesus is the Messiah? But the veil is going to be removed, and they're going to see that, and many of them are, it's happening to them already today. And the story is found in 1 Kings chapter 19. In 1 Kings chapter 19, I got to give you some background. Elijah with the J. He had just did an amazing spectacle of a battle against 850 false prophets. 
And he even made the, the task of what the, what the battle would be, whose God can send fire from heaven. He let the 850 go first and no fire came. Elijah then told all the servants to go down and get the water jars filled with water and he poured the water on the wood. I love this. I did a, I did a message. I, I probably did this message. I don't think I've done it here yet, but I've done this. Have I done it here? You've been with me for so long. You, you, you just believe I've done every message everywhere, huh? <laughs> but maybe I have. Do you remember the message called the, the God of the wet wood? Did I do that here? She says, yeah. No, I mean, no one else is even nodding. They would remember this, you know. The God of the wet wood, yeah. My cook was going, no. So. Yeah, Mike, she's right. Do you remember I put torches down the aisle here? Do you remember that? You were scared because we lit those torches as we, this was, this was seven years ago. That's why most of you don't remember. Some of you just weren't here yet. All right. So in the message of God of the wet wood, Elijah pours water on it so the wood is wet. This is not the way you go to light a fire. You would never take a Boy Scout out and say, if you're going to light a fire, you pour a lot of water on it first, right? It's not, it doesn't happen this way. But you see, Elijah understood the things of the kingdom. The principles of the kingdom are not the principles of this world because God loves to reveal he's greater than this world. So when you have wet wood, you don't try to light wet wood. But he wasn't the one trying to light it. He knew God would light it. And when he stepped back and said, God, show them, the fire came. It says it lapped up the water that was, the water ran off the, the wood so much that it filled the trench all the way around it and lapped up all the water and lapped up the fire and then God destroys the false prophets. Now, you would think Elijah would be on such a high for a long time. Where we find him right now is after his lowest time after that battle. There's something about when we're engaged in the kingdom and especially in the anointing that the flesh is still very tired after a battle that's a spiritual battle. If you've gone through a spiritual battle, you know what I'm talking about. It almost feels like you've just gotten over the flu. You just came through something. You're exhausted. Elijah was emotionally and spiritually depleted. God ministers to him. Remember, he goes up and he hides in this and... and a mighty wind comes by, an earthquake, but God wasn't it. But God was in the still small voice. And Elijah says this. He goes, I'm the only one left in this kingdom of yours. God smiles and says, yeah, your perspective's a little off. There's 7,000 prophets that haven't bent their knee to Baal. You're not the only one. And he says, go now and anoint Elisha. Elijah is going to go and anoint this young man, Elisha. That's where we pick up the story now in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. So Elijah went up from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah, let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye, he said, and then I'll come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people. And then, and they ate, and then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant." Let me tell you briefly, this is the foundational story of the anointing. If you notice here, there was no oil. There was no oil involved in this, but there was a cloak. There was a cloak that is involved, and that's important because we'll come back to that in just a moment. But let's talk about Elisha first. When you go, the anointing must be for really the mature ones. No, he was a, a kid still living with parents at home. 
He was running the 12th pair of oxen himself, living at home, mom and dad still taking care of him, mom and dad providing for everything, but he was learning a work ethic when Elijah came along and put his cloak over him. And he wanted to give a proper farewell. But he also wanted to do something. See, when you sense the anointing is coming your way, you don't want to have paths back to living in the world understanding. You want to burn those bridges to the world. You want to be a kingdom person. So symbolically, he kills the oxen, he burns the plowing part of it and feeds everybody that. Then he goes after the prophet. And I, I love as he, as the very last sentence here, it says, then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. If you want to move in the spirit and under the anointing, you don't move in position first, you move in servanthood. Because even when then God elevates you to position, that position you work at it from a servant mentality, not as, look where I've arrived. Do you see what I am? Do you see where I'm at? You see what I can do? It's never about us. We're always servants in the kingdom of God. Even as he gives you places of position. Elijah got this right, that he went to follow to be a servant before he could be a prophet. All right, now, the story, you got to go ahead to 2 Kings chapter 2, just a couple pages over for there, 2 Kings chapter 2, and this is a, a fairly lengthy part, but it tells the story so well that I'm going to read verses 6 through 14, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 6 through 14. Then Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, remember that's what he had put around Elisha. He took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Or in other translations, it can be of your anointing, your spirit, Elijah replied. You, ask, you have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elijah then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided it to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. Wow. Wow. I, I've always had this dream that in heaven there's going to be a, a movie theater where you can actually go and you can watch these events as they actually happen. That's one that I want to go to that Friday night matinee to see that where this young man who followed, he had that cloak around him from the time he was living with mom and dad. He put the cloak was around him and Elijah takes it off and goes as Elijah burns up his past saying, I won't return to an old way I'm going with the kingdom's way. The kingdom of God has always been established because God has always been. 
we see here he now has the same power of his mentor, the prophet Elijah. He watched Elijah touch the Jordan and it split. He now has done the same thing. The anointing, though, this is very important for you to catch. God's not limited to oil for the anointing. He knows that we need some kind of tangible way. That's why he gives us the sacrament of baptism and we, and we use water as a symbol of, of being washed and, and being buried in Christ and, and being cleansed. Why in communion he gives us the communion host and the, and the blood because he knows that in our world we need visuals. And so the anointing is a visual of, again, the spirit. But God's not limited to the oil for anointing. Number two, the mantle of Elijah was the anointing for Elisha, the cloak. But God's not limited to someone passing on their cloak or their mantle to someone else. In the New Testament, they use this many times. Number three, the laying of hands by elders by elders will pass on the anointing. That's why I felt led as, as I was doing that. I felt like God said, get the the local pastors and all our other local pastors are a good season. They're of my generation and older that would lay hands upon Michael and upon DJ that we laid hands. And so we did a double whammy. We laid hands and we used oil for a double portion on these men. Amen. Now, so the anointing is not, even though it's associated with certain things, that's not what makes the anointing. It's the spirit. It's the power of the kingdom is what the anointing's all about. Many say that Elisha, as he starts out doing his miracles, that his first miracle was what you just saw. He parted the Jordan just like Elijah did. I believe that was just the uh, doing what your mentor had done and that you can do that. I always credit this next miracle as his really first on his own because he'd never watched Elijah do this but God spoke to him and something miraculous took place and I believe there's such rich deep insight into this first miracle some would call it his second found in 2nd Kings chapter 2 just a few verses down from where we stopped at 14, we pick it up in verse 19. In my Bible, it's titled The Healing Waters. Now, watch the description of the land and the water because I believe that this is a foreshadow or a typecast of a people as the land and the water and that when the anointing comes on a people, a holy nation, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, there is healing that comes to that nation. Listen to it in that light. Think of this, it truly did happen, but think of it as a foreshadow or a typecast of something in the future. Verse 19, the people of the city said to Elisha, look, our Lord, this town is well situated as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. What's, what's going on? Water is bad and the land is unproductive. Because the water was bad, the land could not be productive. Bring me a, a new bowl, he said, and put salt in it. So that they brought it to him. A new bowl, very important, and salt. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, This is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. All right. Let me uh, share with you here the anointing and the power. The anointing of power, the first one is his, this miracle here, the healing of the water. There are many, many people that 
Water is always a symbol of life. The water of life, Jesus said, he is the water of life. So you, before you're saved, your water as you is bad, it's poison, it's unproductive. It will not produce fruit. Some years have been so generationally touched by things and deceived by things that you've been unproductive. When someone says to me, do you see, do you see them as a spirit-filled person? Do you see them as, as someone that God is, has put an anointing on? I very rarely try to judge because I don't know where they're at in the transformation process. But when I can see a fruitful life, one that has pushed away the darkness, doesn't embrace it. As a matter of fact, the darkness is a stench to them. <laughs> Growing up in a smoking home, now I'm not trying to put smoking as an evil, bad sin. There, I, I believe there's people that can get to heaven smoking. But I wonder if they're a Christian, if they get there and, and they don't get any reward because they still allowed something of the past to control this temple. My dad, who was a three-pack day palm oil smoker, said, do you think I can get to heaven smoking? He died of lung cancer. I said, Dad, I think God knows that you've tried to surrender all that you could. Interesting, with his lung cancer, he couldn't smoke for the last month of his life, so he had a month clean. Longest time of his whole life. The water was bad before salvation. Your life is unproductive. Now watch this. The bowl was new, okay. You put salt in it. All of you know, no one adds salt to make water good. You add salt, you don't want to drink it. I don't like gargling with salt. I gag when I gargle with salt. Mindy swears by it that it will help you. She must go very literal to this water and salt here, that it purifies something. I've never felt the benefit from water and salt. So it's not what he used. It is what took place when he, by faith, did what God told him to do, and that something transformed the water was made clean and a land productive. He goes on to do two more, two more great powerful things that, that are kingdom supernatural. He did a lot of supernatural things, but these two were very specific in my mind. The supernatural power of the anointing was able to raise an iron ax head. Now, iron doesn't float to the top of any water. That's a kingdom. See, the kingdom is not locked into the rules of this world. That's why I wanted to give you that. And then after Elijah is dead, he is buried in a cave. And you find this in Ezekiel, and they're, they're wanting to bury this soldier, but the enemy is coming, and so they throw the dead soldier's body into the cave where Elisha is buried. And his body comes in contact with Elisha's bones and there's such an anointing that it brings the soldier back to life. And that doesn't happen in the natural. But in the kingdom of God is not the natural. So I wanted to give you, because in the Hebrew, you have to show at least two, maybe three witnesses that the kingdom is different than the earth. The kingdom of God is different. You're seeing this, and, and I want to come back to the very first one, that water was bad, an unproductive life. I will believe that some of you today as a Christian, you have felt as if, though I'm saved, I've, I've invited the Holy Spirit in, I've not seen a productivity in my life. Last night, as, as I was going over this, I said, Lord, I raised both my hands. I said, Lord, I'm claiming this right now. All the things of my past, anything that's still attached to the world there, I, I denounce them, I cut them off. I'm praying for the spirit to fall, that, that this last season of my life will be the most productive season of my life. That there'll be many more milkmen that, that will come to know you 
as Lord and Savior, that many young men and women will sense they have a power and the anointing of God and that their productivity is attached to their surrender to the Spirit. The anointing is the Spirit. If anything is noteworthy, if anything is praiseworthy, it's always God. It's not because you've gotten a position. It's not even because we're going to anoint you with oil. It's because you've surrendered to the old ways. The bad water will cease to be bad and your life will start becoming productive. That's the anointing.